invasion of Ukraine within a wider historical context and really ask the question of how is it going to change the world order? How is it going to change our perception of history as some wars have done and some wars have not? I'm in the side of those who think this war is going to change history much more widely. But we have a fantastic panel to discuss this. And um, we have Timothy Snyder, who I believe is joining us remotely, um, a man who needs almost no introduction, um, professor of history at Yale, um, a man who wrote repeatedly about Ukraine long before it was fashionable and has been a very powerful voice talking about Ukraine in the last year. Um, can I just confirm whether he is indeed joining us remotely? Can somebody let me know that? Yes? Oh, fantastic. Hi, Timothy. Great. And we also have Vladimir Yamolenko, sorry, I get the accent wrong, Yamolenko, who is philosopher, doctor of political studies, and Sviatoslav Vakachuk, who is the social activist, leader of Okean Elsie, and of course, the famous musician. But perhaps we can start with Professor Snyder and ask you, can you hear me okay? Can you wave at the screen if you can? Great, fantastic. Sorry not to see you in person. I think I last was with you in September um, in Kiev. Um, I'd like to start by asking you, you've written extensively about Ukraine. You have made a compelling series of lectures, which you've released f for free for anybody who wants to know more about the history of Ukraine. I would strongly recommend those. Um, and you are, of course, a strong voice trying to make Ukraine better understood in America and the West more widely. Can you tell us, when you look at the current conflict, how do you assess what it's going to mean in his historical terms? I know as a historian, you, you don't like to pre-write history, but can you give us some sense about whether you see this as changing the wider um, era that we're living in right now? Well, Jillian, thank you very much for, for the question. It's it's wonderful to be with all of you, if only remotely. I, I want to I want to greet my friends Volodya Yamalenko and Slava Vakarchuk. It's it's wonderful to be with the two of you and to have a chance to thank you for all that you have done this last year. I'm really really glad to be in your company. In fact, honored to be in your company. As to the history, I would make two points. The first point is that in the larger sweep of European history. The main question, as I see it, is empire versus integration. Those are the real alternatives on the European continent. In the last 75 years or so, European empires have declined and European states have found an alternative in European integration, which has supported democracy and generally brought prosperity. There's the, the alternative to integration is, is not the lonely state. The alternative to integration is the empire. And this is what Russia represents. Russia is an empire and Russia's war against Ukraine can be characterized in many ways as genocidal, as illegal, as a war of aggression, as a violation of the laws of war. But it is, among other things, an imperial war. It's a war to establish or reestablish the principle of empire in Europe. So the outcome of this war in the broadest possible sense, I think, has to do with what sort of Europe there will be. Will the principle of empire be defeated and give way to something better? Or um, will empire reassert itself and will the European integration project in, in Europe be under pressure indefinitely? The second historical point I'd like to make is one that um, Ukrainians have, have reminded me of and helped me to understand this last year. It's, it's very important. It has to do with the rise and fall of democracy. I think one of the great problems of our international order these last 30 years was that we took it for granted that somehow larger structural forces after the end of the Soviet Union would bring about democracy, whether that those larger forces were capitalism or American exceptionalism or something else. We took for granted that history was on our side. And this war has reminded us, if we needed, if we needed reminding, that history is never on anyone's side. If you want to have democracy, you have to say that you want it, you have to value it, and you have to take risks for it. Unfortunately, sometimes bodily risks, corporeal risks. So I think this is a possible turning point for those of us in the West who forgot what democracy, or for that matter, freedom, was really all about. If we want to build an order which is based upon law and democracy and good institutions, we have to remember that behind the law, the democracy, and the good institutions, are values, and values by definition are something that you're willing to take a risk for. 
So that's a turning point which is possible for us. That's an awakening which is possible for us. Thank you. Well, thank you. Those are two very powerful points. And I must say, I wholeheartedly agree with both of them. Um, and particularly the second point about the degree of complacency in the West and the degree to which people have not um, realized what a luxury it is to have democracy and freedom and why you need to fight and defend it. Um, you know, Ukraine has taught the West a very big lesson. I just hope it goes through to the population and the voters as well. But I'd like to bring in Svetoslav here and ask you, um, when you look from the point of view of an artist, someone who spent much of your life involved in creativity, and now an activist, how do you evaluate the long-term historical legacy of this war? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, let me also uh, greet my friend Tim. I'm gr glad to see him in person, online, but still. Uh, and I, I, I need to say honestly that, you know, my wife now is uh, uh, learning history from your, uh, f from your online course. And she, she uh, uh, graduated from the university and she had a course in, in, in Ukrainian history. She says, I wish we had the Professor Snyder, our professor at that time. <laughs> so thanks for everything that you're doing. And it's very important that people like Professor Snyder or present here, my friend Bernard-Henri Lévy, uh, those famous people in the world are advocating Ukraine because I think they as wise and sincere people understand the, the moment of the time. And the moment is, I think, uh, I agree with uh, Professor Snyder that history cannot be on our side but the wind for the history can be favorable or not favorable. You know, if you're, if you're uh, sailing on a, on, a, on a board, you know, you sometimes do it with the wind or without. So I think uh, because, because of tremendous, you know, uh, courage and behavior of Ukrainians during this year, I think the whole world started a sort of... Uh, uh, got a spell on, 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 on us as a nation in a good way of, uh, of saying this. And I think we became a good uh, maybe inspiration for everybody, in, including the Western countries who were a sort of bored living a very good life, you know. And now uh, I think our role is very important. So we are inspiring not only our own people, I think we're inspiring people everywhere. And certainly as a person of, of art, as a person who kind of tried to do it for the last 25 years, I know how spiritual and uh, uh, mental you know, fight and weapons are not less important than the real uh, uh, weapons on the field. So I think that's what all of us are trying to do. I think the president does his job. Uh, talking to the nations and to the parliaments, people like us, we're trying to, to do our modest, you know, contribution. I'm trying to go uh, to even, you know, I'm, I'm going to the trenches and front lines. Of front line, I've already given like 180 performances there and counting. So this is all what we try to, you know, we need to correspond to, to the name and to the flag of blue and yellow that now is so so respected in the world. And I also think that in the long term, this war makes all of us better people. Uh, you know, because the war is a black and white matter. And it's very, it's much easier to calibrate yourself when you, you see something in black and white. So you understand absolutely vividly and clearly what is wrong and what is right. And many people, now during the war, I uh, discovered the themselves doing better, creating better things, behaving better. And I, uh, I think we need, to, we need to keep this mood after the victory, which I'm sure sooner or later will, will uh, uh, come and will um, be real. And the last thing I want to say that uh, maybe uh, Ukraine is unlucky or lucky, you, you name it, but uh, maybe we are in a special time of history when this war of independence that we are now facing uh, is taking place under very close, uh, you know, uh, very close uh, 
observation of the whole world during the unprecedented you know, uh, development of mass media and special internet and social media. So I think if these media, if these social networks, if these famous people existed in 1770, uh, one, uh, 1776, they would be in Philadelphia. If they, uh, if they were succeeded, if they were living in like 18, uh, 1789, they will be in Paris. They could be in, in Poland in the 1918. So very important places of the history. And I think Kiev and Ukraine generally in the front line is something that will define uh, the future of this world for maybe generations. I cannot predict how for how long, but I think it will be quite a long trajectory. And uh, that's why it's so important not only to observe, but also to participate. Not only because it's the right thing to help somebody who, who is on the right side uh, or, or who is doing the right thing, defending his uh, own uh, national land, but also because practically I think this is the moment of the, of the history and if you miss it, it will be very difficult for everybody who miss it and just watch it on the TV. So you need to be part of that. That's what I'm trying to say. Right, well thank you. Um, I'm curious, I mean, you, Svazoslav, you say you've gone to the front lines 180 times to give concerts to the troops. Uh, I went there less, sometimes five or six performances a day. But All right, yeah, yeah. okay, well, <laughs> there's still a lot of performances. Yeah. You've also done a lot of very influential performances online, um, on YouTube and social media. I'm curious, the artists like yourself who are seeking to raise morale and, if you like, redefine the image of Ukraine on the world stage through your art and performances, are you doing that spontaneously or is that something which is being directed by the government? I mean, uh, <laughs> how much is that coming? <laughs> well that, um, I'm asking that because obviously the Ukrainians the are laughing, <laughs> but for the benefit of the non-Ukrainians in the audience, I think you should explain that question because non-Ukrainians might ask that. The first uh, official encounter with government for me during this war was uh, coincidentally today in the morning when I had an honor to accept an invitation of the president in the office to, to sing an anthem in the uh, a ceremony of uh, rewarding our warriors and heroes in the, in the beginning of the day. So it was the first time I actually got something because the government asked me to do. Before that, sadly, no. And I think this is the strength of Ukrainian nation. We are, uh, thankfully, uh, a nation of individuals and the nations where uh, the government doesn't need to tell us exactly, and especially in the uh, hard times, crucial times, what, are, what we need to do. And I think this is the most important, uh, the most important uh, uh, argument why Ukraine will win the war. Because I think we have this very strong motivation which, uh, which actually defines the whole war. It reminds me, if you may say, uh, Professor Snyder, um, you know, uh, I, I see, I, I'm watching you and I have this allegory about, about uh, studying. You know, I, I remember my first uh, grade in the university, my, my first year in the university, and uh, I've seen people who came from the richer families who had a lot of handicap in the beginning and who had, who were much more positioned to, to, to be a successful, I don't know, historian, physicist, physician, you name it. But at the end of the day, they lost uh, in the course of a couple of years because they, didn't, they lacked motivation. They came there because of their parents, because of, uh, there was no other way. They were forced to do that. And sooner or later, they lost to those who were you know, stri striving and struggling and uh, you know, were inspired by, by this education. And the same thing here, Russia will never win this war because their people uh, are not driven by something by else than fear or maybe for some of them in the elite uh, material uh, things, but I, do, I don't even believe in that. I think it's all fear and fear and fear. And Ukrainians are driven with the uh, inspiration to defend our, our land and also we don't have any other choice. So I think the, the very important uh, impact and consequence of, of, uh, mm, of, for your question is that 
we are not asked by anybody. The president was not asked to act the way he did. I am not asked to, uh, to act the way I did. Nobody in this room of Ukrainians who uh, I think contribute a lot to this victory are not asked to do. We just know what to do and then certainly we coordinate the things. Uh, we're not doing it chaotically, but, but I think it's, it's all, it's not spontaneous, it's instinctive. We defend our land, this is it. Well, thank you. I think that's a very good point indeed. And before I turn to... Before I turn to Volodymyr, I'd like to quickly ask Professor Snyder something on the relation to this, pro this issue. I'm going to come to you in a moment, Volodymyr, but um, I'm very struck as somebody who did my PhD in the former Soviet Union, when it was still the Soviet Union, that the story of post-1991 is that Ukrainians have really discovered individual agency and become increasingly confident of having individual agency and tragically, Russia has gone in the other direction. And what's happened in the last year has reinforced that. And I'm curious, Professor Snyder, why do you think that in Ukraine there is such a strong sense of lateral self-organization and agency compared, tragically, to its northern neighbor? Thanks, that's a wonderful question, because I think it reveals, as, as Slava Vakarchuk was just saying, it reveals a fundamental difference in this war where we simply can't say <clears throat> that this war is just about material things. It, it clearly has to do with moral differences or with differences in how people see the world. And, and that, as I think Slava was also trying to say, is one of the reasons why it's very important for people not to be neutral because there's, there's no way of being neutral when there, there are two very different worldviews at play. One of the worldviews involves the idea that we're not responsible for anything. Everything else is always the world's fault. Everything is a conspiracy against us. And therefore, whatever we do is justified. <clears throat> and that's essentially the content of Putin's speeches. That's the inner content of them. We are not individuals. We don't really take responsibility. It's everybody on the other side. And all we have to do is criticize them and kill them. Whereas, as, as I agree with Slava, the, 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 what distinguishes Ukraine, I agree with the premise of your question, what distinguishes Ukraine is this notion that we do bear some responsibility. This is our country. We, it's not perfect, but we should be trying to make it better. And we're willing to do things, indeed, to take risks to make this country better. I think that Ukrainians have learned these things over the last 30 years. I mean, in the 30 years or so that I've been coming to Ukraine, the country has changed a great deal. I, I, the, the, cost, the, the class that you kindly mentioned goes back a thousand years, but the last 30 years of Ukrainian history have been very important. There have been gradual lessons where the turning points were things like 1991 or 2000, 2004, 2005, 2014, the Maidan, and this war, where at each point, Ukrainians in general took a step forward towards the idea that we're responsible for what happens. Crucial turning points in there would be choosing your own leaders, which is something that never properly happened in Russia. Putin was selected by oligarchs, faked, started a war, and has basically been in power ever since. Whereas Ukrainians have managed to change their own rulers peacefully. Another, another very fundamental difference is the development of Ukrainian civil society. The idea that there is, again, I'm, I'm just rephrasing something Slava said, the idea that it's not for the government to do everything. And that's something that you learn as individuals, but you also learn that in the moments when you come together. So I'm struck that when I see the people cooperating in 2014 on the Maidan, it was often people who met, who, who met in some earlier moment, like 2004, 2005. And then when I see people cooperating in 2022, it's often people who met and cooperated for the first time during the Maidan. This is, this is a learning process. It's a learning process which has to do with taking responsibility. Going further back, and I will as a historian, you're gonna have to indulge me, go further back. There is, There are two traditions in Ukrainian history which are very important here. Number one is the Cossack tradition of rebellion, the idea that there are moments where you have to get together and challenge the existing order. And um, going together with that, there's the, the old tradition going back to the Polish-Lithuanian Republic of, of law, that there are laws that people ought to be, be, ought to be, behaving, ought to be behaving according to laws. And interestingly, when you see the great moments of Ukrainian resistance, whether it's Maidan or this war, you see those two things coming together, that we are resisting because there are things worth defending. But ultimately, the thing that we're defending is that we would like to have a better structure. We would like to have a good everyday life. 
we'd like for the future to be to be better than the past. So those are a couple of traditions which I think matter quite a lot. Well, thank you, Professor Snyder. And the reason I ask you that is I very strongly agree with your comments, having observed both Russia and Ukraine for the last 35 years myself. Um, I am officially old and middle-aged, my daughters keep telling me. Um, but also because I don't, I mean, two other points I'll make is firstly, I don't think people in the West understand this distinction clearly enough. And I would counsel all of my Ukrainian friends, if you are speaking to Westerners, to stress the point that Ukraine is a country which does believe in self-determination and individual agency, which is quite different from Russia today. And the second point I'd also counsel my friends to stress is that actually Ukraine has indeed changed quite significantly in the last 30 years in a very positive direction. Um, as a former anthropo or as an anthrop anthropologist, sometimes people think cultures are like Tupperware boxes in the sense that they're sealed and fixed and closed and distinct from each other, and that's wrong. Culture changes over time. It's more like a river. And when I look at the rising sense of self-determination and, and agency in Ukraine in the last 30 years, it is quite remarkable, and it's a story which has to be stressed to the West to make people understand what is, what is at stake in terms of defending Ukraine today. But anyway, Vladimir, tell us your perspective on what you think um, are the key lessons of what's going on for history as a philosopher and academic. Thank you. Um, it's, it's very, very good and, of course, big honor to be with Slava and with uh, Timothy. I would like to ju just develop, uh, elaborate on, on, on those things that I've heard. I think that uh, beyond these two things that t uh, Tim mentioned, the Cossacks and the Rzecz uh, Pospolita, there is another element, which is medieval element, uh, which is uh, an element of Rus. And we don't actually know very much about uh, about Rus, maybe, right? But it's interesting how it, it medieval history entered into Ukrainian discourse. If you look at the 19th century Ukrainian intellectuals like Mykola Kostomarov, they would tell you that, look, what is specific about Rus is that it was plural. It was a a polity which had plural centers, which have a plurality of centers. We can say, well, this is a typical medieval feudalism and etc. But it's very interesting how it sneaked into the 19th century reflection about what Ukraine is. And then if you look at, at Ukrainian intellectuals of that time, and it's profoundly, I mean, if you study Ukrainian intellectual history and the Russian intellectual history, it's, it's a profound difference uh, back in the 19th century because you can hardly find a Russian intellectual, whether so-called westernizer or Slavophile, who would be not anti-European. Mm -hmm. So even the westernizers, such, such as starting from Yertsin until, until, until the nihilists, until the Marxists, they were all actually anti-European. And there is something that unites the Russian intellectual history. Slavophiles, of course, they were saying that Russia is different from Europe, etc. Whereas even if you take Ukrainian Slavophiles, I mean, you can, you can say that Taras Shevchenko is a Ukrainian Slavophile, right? Uh, these Slavophile traditions comes from the European Sla uh, Slavophile traditions, from the Slovak and Czech Slavophiles. And it, uh, it was profoundly European from, from the very first moment. And I think it's very interesting. Therefore, for example, I'm always asked, what are the roots of the Ukrainian resistance? And I'm just, uh, I'm just saying, look, they are very much profound. And if you look at the Drahomanov that I mentioned, his primary word is the word gromada, which means community. Well, when you travel around Ukraine right now and you see these very local elements of, of resistance, and I, I travel a lot as well, I go to the to the south, uh, to Kherson, to the north, to Sumy, to, to the front line, to, to Izum, to, to Slovyansk, Kramatorsk. Everywhere I see this, that this resistance is based upon Romandas, upon the local communities, in your village, in your town. And this is the most, and sometimes these local communities actually uh, resist even this when the state pull, pulls off. And that's very, very interesting. Yeah. And uh, I have also lots of reflections about the idea of empire, but maybe we will come back to this. Okay, well, let's come back to empire. By the way, one thing I would say is it unifies the Russian intellectuals of the 19th century is a t they take empire for granted. 
as automatically being a natural thing and good thing, which of course the Ukrainian tradition doesn't. But so very quickly to build up on that, uh, just concrete example. I think you're completely right, Volodymyr. Uh, everybody, including people in the West, now know. Unfortunately, because of infamous. Uh, story of uh, small town of Borodyanka. So I remember when I was there like a couple of days after reliberation and I met the mayor, uh, a very interesting guy who absolutely depicts everything you just said. So he told me, and I think everybody knows this story, how, how uh, they were trying to exist, uh, understanding that they are already occupied and he certainly was uh, hiding because it was dangerous for him to be public. He 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 never, um, never they never managed to capture him. Thankfully, but he was hiding for weeks, but still doing his job. You know, still doing his job, hiding. You know, it's that's. I think this little but very uh, profound story depicts everything about Ukraine. Uh, this nation is unbeatable because of people who can do their job even under circumstances when when you think that they, any doing of job is impossible. And the same thing you can tell about the officers, the commanders of the small units in the front line, or first, uh, you all know these stories of first weeks of uh, defending of Kiev and the region when there were uh, certainly a lot of, um, let's say, self-responsible deeds and actions by, by local commanders, which made huge difference. So I, I totally agree with it. Well, I think one of the things that certainly the American military has been looking at very closely in relation to the Ukrainian military is the level of self-organization. Um, and as an anthropologists talk about two principles that bind societies together, you can either have vertical um, hierarchies where information goes up and orders come down, or you have lateral self-organization. And of course, the first model is what the Russian army is based around. The second one is, to a large degree, it's been dis on display with the Ukrainian army. But there's one other issue which I find fascinating, which again, I suspect historically will be very important with Ukraine, which is the role of digital networks. Because I would argue, in addition to Professor Snyder's points about the Cossack tradition of rebellion, and the long-standing Polish um, you know, canonical respect for law. What's happening today, though, is also you're seeing in Ukraine extraordinary lateral self-organization through digital networks, through the internet. And I'm curious about that because your songs are raising morale and sending messages through the digital sphere, through these kind of lateral networks as well. How important do you see digital networks as being in terms of creating a different model of government and self-organization today? Uh, it's not an easy question. I think uh, I'm uh, apologetic to the idea that social media uh, bring both good and bad things to the world. Uh, maybe it's a trivial thought, but that's what, what it is. And I think that many democracies uh, suffer now from vulnerabilities of democracies because social media actually um, uh, speculate on that very much. But I agree with you that in Ukraine uh, they made a very good job, uh, not only now but during the Revolution of Dignity. Even at the beginning, the re Orange Revolution, where it was all just the beginning, no social media, no social networks, but just the internet, it helped a lot. And because Ukrainians are self-organizing, I think uh, social networks and social and internet media is an ideal uh, environment for them. Because this is created for somebody who, if not censored, like in Russia, China, or Iran, so this is this creates huge opportunity to self-organize. I think American uh, founding fathers and those who were leaders of military uh, resistance wished they had internet uh, that day because I think it would be much easier for them. But uh, that's what we are trying to, to use and do now. And I think uh, we need also to praise a lot of volunteers and social activists who actually through social media organized a lot of people, raised a lot of money, uh, charity things, uh, created, uh, I would say, 
internal world, worlds for those for whom uh, outside physical world was dangerous. I'm talking about the occupation and front line and everywhere. So, and still, and as they are still doing it. While we are sitting here in relatively safe, I can say relatively because you all know where we are, but relatively safe place, uh, at, this, the, at this time, uh, people in occupied territories uh, which are still not liberated, there are activists, there are uh, social activists, there are peop people uh, who care, there are leaders who, who are doing their job under very dangerous circumstances and they keep uh, you know, rising the spirit of those who live there. They keep organizing people, even in some, let's say, neutral things, mm -hmm. but still, uh, still using it. So, uh, my personal, uh, you know, job or uh, people like me, we didn't do a lot. We just do our arts or do this piece of energy, and then people disperse it through, uh, through social media, and I'm really glad that we have it, because nowadays not only me, like more known artists or people, but absolutely unknown people can make a difference in a single day, writing a, a huge song or making a great post on, uh, on uh, Twitter or internet, and it unites people, it creates, swirls new kind of emotional uh, level, yes. and it builds and builds and builds on, uh, on, on, on each next layer, and it's unbeatable. Absolutely, well, or Professor Snyder, I mean, if you go back 10 years ago, there's no way that your extremely earnest, lengthy series of lectures on Ukrainian history would have had, how many views is it now? How many people they have, have viewed your lectures? I, I mean, it, it's gotta be getting close to 10 million. 10 I million I people. Recently, but Wow. Well, you can have a, have a, have a competition with Fiat to how many I people think, have watched your yeah, song. Jay, my Jane, I think, did probably half of a million only alone. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she, she's watching it every day. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, coming back to the point that digital, digital technology has changed the war, it's changed the way that Ukraine has fought back, and by doing that, Ukraine will change the future of war and conflict and the way that people use digital technology in the future. But Volodymyr, you've been I very would, patiently would, uh, wanting to come in. I would, I would just add that, of course, I agree with all the positive sides of the digital world, but we also have to understand the negative side of it. And I think the key negative side of it is this, this certain anti-world that it is creates, that is certain virtual world that it creates. And, uh, and uh, actually, it's an illusion that you can win the war or a revolution with Facebook or Twitter, right? Uh, sometimes people get into very much virtual world, and uh, that also is something that is happening with Russian propaganda. Russia, Russia is trying to create this virtual world. And by the way, I think it is also kind of a linked with the Russian intellectual tradition. I'm criticizing it a lot uh, because there is certain devaluation of the empirical truth in this. If you, if you look back into Russian uh, religious philosophy, etc., what is important about the virtual world? It has to lead to action. If it doesn't lead to action, it's, it's right. meaningless. So when we use the virtual world to collect funds, to, to do something, etc., that's very good. But frankly speaking, I, I think the Slava also knows a big number of people who are actually not covered by this virtual world. And just a recent story that we went to a, a village called Kamyanka after Izum between Izum and Slovyansk, and it's totally destroyed. And actually, you don't understand the uh, the, uh, the, the scale of this destruction, you don't understand it with photos. You should go to Borodyanka and see it with your own eyes. Photos don't, don't, really, don't really make you understand it. And this is a village in, in which 1,000 houses, nothing is, is there, everything is destroyed. And people are still living there without electricity, without everything. So imagine these people who are cut off from this virt uh, virtual world, but they exist. I mean, this is a, a big lie of this postmodern uh, epoch uh, that if you don't exist, on if, you are, if you're not online, you don't exist. You exist, this, is, this yes. is reality. And we have to fight for reality. This is very important. Absolutely. Um, we have several people in the audience who are slated to make some comments. Um, Oh, yes. Okay. We have a request from Thank <laughs> Victor. You. Tell us your thoughts on Empire, and then we're going to turn to Natalia, Marcy, Carl, Alex, and Benjamin uh, in the next sort of 30 minutes. Okay. No. 
just just a one element about Empire. I, I think that Tim is absolutely right when he describes in his course, by the way, as well, uh, this fight as the fight uh, uh, between the idea of empire and the idea of republic. But what should we understand, first thing, is that Russia is indeed the last empire in Europe, and the European history was a history in the 20th century of the deimperialization. And uh, Tim, I just uh, want to uh, really greet you with the way how you described it in your course. But uh, I would like to add something about it. There is a difference between maritime empires and continental empires. The maritime empires to which uh, people are accustomed to in Western Europe are actually colonizing the other. They're colonizing distant people who are distant in geography, who are distant in identity, who are distant in ethnicity, etc. Therefore, the key mechanism of domination is the idea of difference. The, the maritime empires say that you are different from me, you have never no chance to become the same as me, therefore, I'm hierarch, I'm higher than you. Continental empires like Russia are doing a different thing. They're colonizing close people, close in geography, close in, in uh, linguistically, ethnically, like Ukrainians, Belarusians, for example. And the mechanism of domination is not the idea of difference, but the idea of sameness. They're saying, you will never have a chance to be different from me. And that's very important. Why it is the important? For two reasons. The first reason is that the work of assimilation is very important. And therefore, we are facing all the situation when there is a long Russian propaganda that Ukrainians do not exist, that they're the same as, as Russians. And we are fighting for that. And, and therefore, the question of identity is so important. Mm. The question of identity, national identity, which was so uh, uh, looked with suspicion in, in many Western media, I mean, um, and, and uh, intellectuals until the last moment when, when you were talking about Ukrainian nationalism, how bad it is, how dangerous it is, etc. The idea of national identity is so important, it, it comes hand in hand with the idea of human rights and liberalism, etc. And that's a very important thing we have to understand. The second thing is that while the Russian Empire, Russian Federation right now, have assimilated lots of nations inside, and now you, you, you can see that, well, 80% of the population say that they are Russians. It's not necessarily that they are ethnically Russians. So the question is that Oleksii is actually on, on the first panel raised, the disintegration of Russia on which borders it will take place. It's not that uh, obvious. It's not, it's not that clear than, for example, with maritime empires. So I think we have to look into the future with understanding of this aspect. I think that's very, very true. And the difference between being Ruski and Rusiania is very important right now. And it's going to become increasingly important. But um, Right, we have a number of people who would like to comment, I believe. Natalia, I think you are top of the list. Um, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so on, on, on this topic, um, I think I uh, really admire what always Tim writes about this war against nihilism, and I think we, c we were able to prove it, <laughs> you know, like with the facts. So for instance, within the last months, we were exactly following closely the attacks on the local administration and the occupation in the Ukrainian South and Kharkiv. And what was interesting when we're really looking at the testimonies of dozens of the people, um, you know, and how the Russians explained to them, you know, what they were doing. There were very little ideology, you know, as if you, even it was the use this term, which I honestly liked a lot, like Pochomkin village for the, of the occupation, when a lot has been done for this virtual picture for the Tsar, saying like, we do things, but on the ground, nothing was really done, you know, beyond the violence. So there was no governance, there was no, you know, a real explanation what actually Russia represents. But this incapacity of the Russian soldiers um, also created their, you know, cruelty, because they were incapable to do something. The only thing they can do, you know, to find some people to persecute them. So so I think it's also very important uh, in the international discussions. I often, a lot of people trying to find the reason. What is the ideology? What their suggestion? Is it the Cold War? Is it you know uh, something like that? So so see that, that that's something else. About the history for Ukraine, couple of things. I think one of the things we are very much, uh, I think a lot of internationals cheering up the Ukrainian civil society and Ukrainian unity and this moment, the birth of the Ukrainian identity, something I really not very much appreciating because I think it was there and the unity was there. But the interesting process, it's really we living in the time when the, for the first time Ukrainians have their state, mm -hmm. the state which depends 
them and they really understand and value that. So the most interesting process is happening now between the Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian state. And that would be the long lasting legacy of this war. But for the world, we, we, what is also very interesting for me, what would be the lasting uh, legacy for, for the international order? Also to, um, I, I despite having team here and Volodya speaking about the history, I really um, want to build upon something you told uh, about the last 30 years. I really think it's not really about like kind of freedom in the Ukrainian national DNA, but indeed for 30 years it was more or less the democratic society with some flaws. And this is the good sign for the other societies in non-democratic countries, that it's not just about the history. You actually, in this part of the world, y you know, in the part of the world where there was no democracy, you can build a democratic society. Uh, and the democratic society can be more efficient, it can be strong. Uh, but final uh, remark is about the accountability again, uh, because I think the Ukraine, um, is really give a good chance for restore of the international order and accountability. Because despite all the horrors happening in Ukraine, uh, we have really the chance, the chance, uh, there shouldn't be less skepticism about keeping uh, people who should be kept accountable. Uh, because there is a transparency, there is access, there is amount of the evidence of the war crimes and crimes against humanity. So if the perpetrators are not punished in this war, with the perfect circumstances, everything is on the table. Yes, everything can be done fast. It means the the legal system just doesn't exist. It should yes. should be thrown, and that's what is on the stake. Uh, right. So that would would be my um, my. Input. Thank you. I can see someone over there wants to come in with a very quick comment, and then Volodymyr, and then we'll go to Carl. Okay, okay. Uh, so this is uh, a comment and a question also to uh, Volodymyr particularly, because you, you have grappled with these questions, and this is the way Russia has been using this anti-colonial sort of uh, rhetoric. Uh, New York Times had an article the, the other day uh, which shows that uh, almost half the world does not really see eye to eye with the rest of the world, the Ukraine supporters. They don't see this as a, as a, as a struggle for uh, some kind of ideals, democracy, they're much more cynical about this, uh, contrary to what the United uh, uh, Nations General Assembly voted, once again, wholeheartedly to support Ukraine and against Ru uh, Russia's invasion. The, the rest of the world, the global south, doesn't care. It's not their fight, you know. Uh, how do we even begin to counter this anti-colonial message that Russia has been trying to harness to justify its atrocities in Ukraine? Big question. I can see, it. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll see. Yeah. That's a very big question, actually, and very important. I think uh, what what Ukrainians need to do right now uh, to go to this, let's call it global south, although I think it's, the term is misleading, uh, it's try to uh, build a horizontal communication. Because we're talking about imperialism, about colonialism, etc. This is very important. But I, I think what is even more important is to see into structural uh, some structural similarities between such societies as Ukrainian and other colonized societies. And we will find lots of interesting things. For example, we will find a special attitude to nature. Because usually these societies, you know, they kind of uh, were suspicious about modernization, industrialization, etc. And in their folk culture, they maintained a very interesting, I would say, eco culture or bio culture. That's what Ukrainians, are, I think, know about. The second thing is that in these societies, usually you, you don't have a real split uh, between tradition and modernity. I think this is one of the big uh, strengths of the Ukrainian society is that we, we don't actually, we, 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 we try to combine in, in our literature, in our culture, historically, tradition and modernity. Look at Ukrainian modernists, for example, in late 19th century, late early 20th century, who were modernists and traditionalists at the same time. And this is very interesting because in the current world, like Western world, we see the big clash between tradition and modernity. Right. And this, this leads me to what Natalia was saying. It's very, uh, very important. I think there are two things. First, we need to analyze the, the, the deep things in our culture to understand on which we can actually build upon. And I do think that we can build upon on these, I would say, Republican traditions, not that much democratic, but Republican traditions. On the other hand, I totally agree with you that we cannot be these prisoners of history. And I think what, what we are now going through actually in the 21st century is the new wave of democratization which, go, which goes beyond Europe, which goes in Maghreb, which goes in Middle East, which goes in, in Caucasus. And in many aspects, as we know, 
uh, these democratic waves were defeated. But that right. doesn't mean that they will be defeated forever. And here, the global uh, global role of Ukrainian fight is is very very much important. And why should why we, we should be prepared for democracies rising in sometimes unexpected geographies? Because if we read the classics of political thought from Aristotle to Montesquieu, there is a very clear idea that they had in mind: democracies are very fragile. Uh, so they had no idea of this, you know, end of history or something like that. They understood how democracies denigrate into tyrannies. They had the idea of this kiklos, this cyclical um, history, and I think they were mu much more sober. And in this sense, we should understand that, you know, nothing is ine inevitable, both in the good and, and bad uh, way. Right. Yeah, do you want to say something? Otherwise, just I'll bring in the other. Yeah, just very quickly. Um I think we shouldn't, uh, uh, let's say, complain a lot. We should just do and work. Uh, I think that, uh, frankly, we lost our homework during the last 30 years in convincing other nations who we are. And I think uh, we, we, di we didn't only fail with countries in Africa or South America, or we also failed with countries of West, the problem, the, the difference is that the countries of West much more um, have much better understanding of what's going on here, because they still remember uh, they were real participants of both world wars, and they still remember what what is on the stake. Certainly, other countries which were like former colonies, they uh, de, de facto also participated, but these wars didn't, were not their wars. So when I'm t talking about like countries like Western Europe or the United States, uh, what we call Global West, they just vividly understood what was on the stake after Russia started invading uh, Ukraine. And they, I think, partly started to help and being so empathetic, not only because they like what Ukraine is doing, but still they have this instinctive uh, feeling of self-preservation and they are working on it very, very right. hard. And then countries which are remote from this part of the world, they are looking at that from the point of view of calculus and chessboard and realpolitik because it's not probably in their, in their, in their veins. And, it, and we need to work. If we can convince Germany and France, if we can build strong relationship with Poland, if we can uh, have such a great uh, you know, support from the United States and other countries, which were not the case like 10, 15, 20 years ago, well, they were not the case. That means that we will, we have a chance to succeed with building relationships with all the countries in the world. We just need to keep doing, uh, not waning or complaining, but Working every day, our diplomacy, our business, our you know uh, uh, informational front, everybody, from me and Natalia to Victor, to uh, philosophers, to 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 our you know uh, politicians who are here, everybody needs to do their job. Go physically or uh, virtually to Africa, go to uh, South America, go to Asia and work. And I think in maybe in a, in in a, in, a, in a generation, especially after we win, where the strong the case of Ukraine will be stronger, we will succeed, and we will have a lot of uh, good partners there who understand us. So right. it's our problem that they don't understand them now. We need to work on it. Right. Well, that's very well said. And I say when you do go forth and talk to the rest of the world, stressing the points about self determination and self organization, I think is very important. But I'd like to bring in three European voices right now. Um, one is Thomas Erndl, who's the German parliamentarian and deputy chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in, Ger in, in Germany. Um, I'd then like to bring in Alex Sobel, who is from the uh, British parliamentarian, and Benjamin Haddad, who's a member of the National Assembly of France. So, um, Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much. It's really great to follow the discussion and uh, you just said uh, we need to go to Germany and France and others to convince people. I think you have convinced already uh, a lot of uh, Germans and I think um, that's clear that there are no more debates needed whether Ukraine is a country in between or a, uh, a neutral country or whatever. It's clear from now on that Ukraine is a European country and uh, that is... Uh, 
and yeah. and that a sovereign <laughs> country is not a proxy but really can be proud of uh, of what you achieved and the it's also a day of respect i would say because the reason why we can be here is because brave ukrainians defended uh, the country from the evasion, or at least uh, this part, uh, and uh, and that is also something uh, where we have to say uh, full respect. And we realized and learned that speed matters, and so we keep on pushing for further support uh, and uh, further um, weapons delivery, and also for the question of security guarantees, which is not just a question of EU membership, but in my view, personally, also a question of NATO membership. So all the best and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I think, as Sviat just said, coming from a German parliamentarian, that is doubly potent at the moment. So thank you. Um, Alex Sons Sobel, would you like to say something? Um, I should say, by the way, we're going to wrap up in about 10 minutes. So we need to keep comments fairly short. So thank you for... Thank you. Um, it's been a fascinating panel. Um, I just want to pick up maybe on some of the points about empire and imperialism. Um, but we also need to think about the strong man in politics. So the strong man in Moscow, before the invasion of Ukraine, saw the weakness of the West, the Western alliance and Western politics. Th there was a pattern here in Syria the West withdrew its support from the opposition to Assad, let Russia have the field. In Afghanistan, there was withdrawal of support from the Afghan army in the collapse of Kabul. So uh, th this is part of a pattern, it's not an isolated event. You know, the, the Second World War started, wasn't an isolation, there was the Spanish Civil War before, where other Western governments didn't support the Republic in Spain. So now we have to rebuild, and democracy is very important, but. Moscow isn't the only place there's a strong man. Moscow's not the only place where there are imperial ambitions. There are many other places. We need to think about soft power as well and economic imperialism, so China, Indonesia, other countries. And so actually we think, we think about cultural power. What's the largest growing cultural institution in the world? Not the British Council or the Goethe Institute, but the Confucius Institute. They're going round and TikTok and social, yeah, and, and, and Chinese digital power. So we need to, the West, West needs to think about these and not be seduced right. by just by having this one um, uh, conflict here. It's a global yes. conflict for democracy and we need to be much stronger. So pro-democracy, anti-empire, and there needs to be a battle in every front to actually support, you know, to pick up those themes. Um, Monsieur Haddad, uh, Benjamin, yes. Hi, I'm honored to be here. I just want to say uh, two quick things. We've been talking all day about what has changed for Ukraine since uh, February 24th, I want to say a word about what has changed for Europeans, because I also think that's a turning point and we, we won't go back. Uh, Professor Snyder was talking about uh, the value of freedom going, uh, coming back to Europe, uh, but we've also seen the, the reality of war coming back to Europeans. Now, I don't want to say it's a return of history or return of war, because it was already there. It was there in the 90s in the Western Balkans. It was there when Russia uh, attacked uh, Georgia in 2008. It was there with the annexation of Crimea and the, the beginning of the war in, in Donbass. But the truth is, Europeans were in denial of it. We thought it were anachronistic moments. We thought it was localized crisis. It wasn't a full-fledged assault on the idea of freedom and the European idea. And I think that has changed durably. And you see it a, a year on, European societies, European public opinions, and of course, European governments are still united and steadfast in their support for Ukraine until uh, victory. And the second thing I want to say, you know, I was about to start saying I fully agreed with Alex. And the truth is you don't hear these days so, uh, so often French uh, politicians saying they fully agree with a British politician. <laughs> and, um, you know, my first time in Ukraine, Ukraine is to blame. And my first time in, in Ukraine was during the Revolution of Dignity, the Maidan movement in, in 2014. I came as a pro-European person. And for the first time in history, anywhere, I saw uh, young people, young men and women, dying for the, for the European flag, being shot at because the idea of the European Union represented for them a better future, democracy, the fight against uh, corruption. And today, despite our division and bickering in Europe, all Europeans stand behind Ukrainians. And so I want to thank you because in 2014, like today in 2022 and 2023, Ukrainians are teaching us to be better Europeans. And this is one more reason, like my German colleague said, 
that you fully deserve, of course, your place in the European Union. Absolutely. By popular demand, I want to come back to Professor Snyder in just a moment. Before I do, Carl, do you want to say anything at all, reflect briefly? You've got about one minute just to comment because we haven't got a lot of time left. And then Professor Snyder, I'd like you to uh, No, I just have a question to Professor Snyder and you others. Oh, even uh, better. Great. Yeah, so, Professor Snyder, you have a question coming your way. You, you have a question coming your way. Uh, when we discuss sort of Russia, Ukraine, the cultural, the historical difference, where is Belarus? Tim, do you want to say anything on that front? Where, um, so where, yeah, is, where is Belarus and where is it going? And if you want to reflect so on anything else that's been said, um, by popular demand, people are keen to hear your views. I keep getting signals from the audience. You can't see the audience, but they keep saying they want to hear more of you. Okay, that's, that's Other than that's your 20-part or 200-part lecture series. Yeah, I wish I wish I were with you, and I'll be there again in Ukraine soon. Um, so on Belarus, when I when I gave my lecture series on Ukraine, I have to say one of my regrets was that I've never given a lecture series on Belarus because you could actually give a whole lecture series on Belarus. Its history is also fascinating, and there are overlapping themes and um, and there are important differences. But I don't have any doubt that there's a trajectory to Belarusian history which is different from the history of the Russian Federation. I think also after 2019, we shouldn't have any doubt that Belarusian civil society exists and is capable of self-organization. The self-organization was younger and newer, and it wasn't successful, and I think they made some tactical mistakes. But we can't really doubt at this point that there's Belarusian civil society and a Belarusian nation. I think that where Belarus is, um, you know, to answer Carl Bildt's question, de de depends very much on the outcome of this war. I think the future of Belarus probably hangs on the outcome of, of this war, because in the scenarios where Russia is defeated and Russia has to be reformed, th there, um, there emerge the opportunities for Belarus to become a truly sovereign state. The second thing I wanted to say has to do with whether Russia has ideology or doesn't have ideology. I think vacuums are very dangerous in and of themselves. You know, I, I agree broadly with the idea that, that Russia doesn't have a, 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 an ideology which is trying to share. I just think that vac vacuums suck you in and destroy you, you know, precisely because the, the president of the Russian Federation has nothing to say, he's angry, precisely because the Russian soldiers have nothing to offer, they're angry. And so what they, what they put in front of us is the idea that everything is our fault, that, you know, that we are satanic or whatever it might be. And that's not a positive idea. It's not an interesting idea. It's the absence of an idea. But it's still very dangerous. And I think what that reminds us of and should remind us of, and here I'm echoing Splava and Volodya in different ways, is that we have to stand for things. You know, we, we have to say what we stand for and act in a way which is consistent with what we stand for. And then the third, the third and final thing I wanted to say has to do with, um, with, with history and, and war. And now I'm following up on the, on the three European parliamentarians whose voices I was so, so glad to hear. It's, it's very true that war is crucial to the shaping of European history. And it's also very true that this notion that Europe is all about peace has been a bit of a self-deception from the beginning. Europe is not about peace. Europe is about losing imperial wars and then finding something better. And when you remember that it's about that, you know, whether it's Algeria or whatever it might be, whether it's Germany and Ukraine in 1945 or whatever it might be, when you remember it's about losing imperial wars and finding something better, then you, re then you recall, okay, Russia should lose this imperial war and find something better. And indeed, it's part of Europe's mission to make sure that Russia loses this imperial war. If Europe is going to be Europe, that's something that has to happen, not only for Ukraine's sake, but also for, for, for Europe's sake. And this is just the, the, very, the very specific and concrete historical point that I wanted to close on. I agree completely that um, Europeans have now you know, taken in the reality of war. But what, what history teaches us about wars is that they have to be won and that it matters a great deal who wins. And so all of these moral and political points that we're making are very important. Even the question about anti-colonialism in the global south, it depends upon this. Ukraine has to be right, but Ukraine also has to win while being right. And if Ukraine wins while being right, then a lot of these other questions will then sort themselves out. So you know, what we have to do is the easy part. 
Slava and Volodya keep saying what they're doing is easy. What they're doing is very hard compared to what we in the West have to do. All we in the West have to do is make sure that the Ukrainians get what they need so that this war can win. And if I can have one more historian's point, one thing which is very strange to me about the journalism of this war is that people keep asking, how is it going to end? Is it ever going to end? Like there's this very weird impatience. It's going to end when the Ukrainians have what they need in order to prevail. And that's up to us. We're not spectators. We can't just pretend we're just writing about this or watching it. Wars end when one side wins. And so if we want this war to end, as we should, we have to make sure that one side wins. Um, and that side, of course, has to be Ukraine. Well. Well, thank you, Tim. I think you said that very, very powerfully indeed, and it's a very good note on which to start to bring to get, bring to today's discussion to a close. Um, I'll just share one thing on a personal point of view to echo what you said, which is that um, when I went to the former Soviet Union in 1989, um, I spent two years doing research, and I assumed, like almost everyone I spoke to in those days, that the Soviet Union would last forever. And then I went through the really shocking, shattering experience of seeing the community I worked with essentially descend into civil war and pogrom. And a number of my friends and colleagues died in that, and it was very brutal. And then I went back to America and Europe and had an even more shocking experience, which is it felt as if I'd gone into a world back in Europe and America where people seemed to be partly anesthetized. Everyone I spoke to in the West seemed to have no comprehension of what it was like to live in a world where systems collapsed, all the certainties broke down, and where history was something which didn't just proceed as predictably as the lines on a chart of a financial analyst. Um, everyone in the West thought that history was something that just kind of went in one straight line and nothing radical would ever change, and actually, there wasn't really any good or evil or things that were really worth fighting for. Europe and the West really forgot, as we've heard today, what values mattered and why democracy and systems are fragile and worth fighting for. And they also forgot that cultures and history can change. And actually, there is such a thing as seizing history and rewriting it. And I think the story of what Ukraine has given the world in the last year is a dramatic wake-up call about what matters in the West and why systems are fragile and why we have to fight to defend values we care about. And if we don't, societies crumble for the worst. And so my one great hope is that the West will repay this lesson by supporting Ukraine and trying to remake history in a better direction going forward. Um, that's essentially why I'm here. I think it's why everyone who is not Ukrainian is in the room today, is to both to recognize what we've learned from Ukraine the last terrible year, to try and put those lessons into practice over the next year. But most importantly, we in the West need to repay that lesson by supporting Ukraine as it goes forward and upholds the spirit not just of democracy, but self-determination, self-organization, and the belief that history can be changed and it is possible to make it better. And the last thing is, just as nobody I spoke to in the sphere of Soviet studies ever believed back in 1990 that the Soviet Uni Union could collapse and there would be a different future, I like to tell anyone in the West to say, that actually we can't imagine a different future for Russia or for Ukraine. Just look at history and you're wrong. It can be different, and I think that's what we're all fighting for today. So that's my, my personal feelings. Thank you all very much indeed for participating. And I'm now gonna hand over to Victor, who's gonna say the closing words. Sorry, I'm wrong. I'm going to hand over to Alexander, who's going to say the closing words, as a former president of Poland yes, yes. and has a very Gillian. powerful perspective. Yeah, Julian, thank you. And uh, that is difficult to, to say uh, something more, as you said now, as a conclusion of this conference. But uh, please allow me first to start uh, to thank a man who decided to organize all of us uh, and to organize this meeting uh, today. 
uh, one year after the beginning of this uh, war, Viktor Pinchuk, because it was his idea, it was his, his determination, and um, uh, I want to thank also his team, because uh, it was uh, logistically very complicated, and, uh, uh, but it was a great decision to, to, to invite us to Kiev today because uh, we feel it and we show that uh, despite the war, we are in the safe city, we are in the country which is well organized, which can uh, offer to us uh, not only security, but also place uh, to discussion, uh, etc. But because we have one year after the war, please allow me to uh, say, especially to all international guests, uh, that's true that when the war started, uh, few of us expected that uh, Ukrainians will be so courageous, so brave, so well organized and so um, uh, effectively fighting. And after one year, uh, they need still our support, but they need also our good word. So please applaud Ukrainian courage, Ukrainian fight, Ukrainian all um, uh, fighters and victims of this war. I think we, from the abroad, who are only for one or two days in Kiev, we are obliged to applaud this absolutely unbelievable, fantastic people in Ukraine. Swava Ukrainian. Thank you very much. It's beauty, beautiful anthem. But uh, I should, uh, frankly speaking, finish my speech now. <laughs> but I have something more to say, and I'm very sorry about it. But um, uh, uh, because I, I wasn't prepared for this, for this great um, uh, uh, idea of, of the anthem. But but speaking so about Ukraines and Ukrainians, uh, I tell you. I understand because I participated in the last um, uh, many months, one year, in many discussions. And I tell you, you are right to complain that everything what is coming from the world, from the West, is, is not enough, is not enough, is, is too late, etc., etc. But please understand that United West, NATO and European Union is helping Ukraine very, very much. Many millions of Ukrainians are living abroad with full support of the countries. Almost two million in Poland, more than one and a half million in Germany, in other countries. And I think today, and that's especially my um, wish to our Ukrainian participants, let's express your gratitude that the world is with you. The world is supporting you. You have absolutely huge support from the many countries in the democratic world, and that is necessary to continue. Because sometimes if we speak about the problems, we have not a full picture. Because the real picture of today's world is Ukraine has the support of democratic countries. Not only governments, not only parliaments, but simple people. 
ordinary people on the streets. And I think that is a good reason to applaud all these nice people in the world who are supporting Ukraine today and will support Ukraine to the end, to the victory. Thank you. Well, and to, and two short points now. Okay. What is the lesson of uh, this meeting? And not only, I think uh, we have two important um, uh, lessons. First, we have to give Ukraine more weapons, uh, more military support. Why? Because it was uh, underlined a lot of uh, uh, arguments, but I want to, to show one very important uh, problem. Russia has much bigger human resources to continue this war as, as Ukraine. And the difference, and I, please understand me correctly, I respect all human beings. I, I respect the people from Siberia, I respect everybody. But uh, frankly speaking, today, the possibility of Russia is to use all these not very well-educated people from many regions of the, of the country and Ukraine is using in this war the best people. It looks like in Polish history, we know very well the situation from Warsaw Uprising 44, where the best people, students, um, uh, well-educated people were fighting and we lost these people. Because we want to be, we, we, we should, uh, keep this human resources of Ukraine as much as, as, as possible in good form so is necessary to give them good weapon, good support. Yeah, please, it will come. I think that is my appeal. It will come. Too late probably, but it will come. You will have a, pl yeah, I understand. You will, you will have all, this, all the things. This is first. We should protect human resources of Ukraine because that can be absolutely a very important factor. And second point uh, for Ukrainians, uh, it was discussed today. We should, dis we should start to look how Ukraine will see after the war. We need Ukraine democratic with full respect to human rights, with respect to market economy, right. respect all these main values which are connecting all of us in democratic world. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much for your time and for your efforts to be here. And Slava Ukraini again. Slava Ukraini.